But it all comes down to traction control. An internal combustion engine can be adjusted in its output maybe a couple times a second. But an electric motor can go from full power to nothing a thousand times a second. But what does this actually mean? Today we'll start a four-day series on traction control, the concept behind it, how it works, what Jason Camisa means by this, and if he's right. Today we'll start with the concept. The concept is that we need to slow wheels down individually if they start to slip, and this will allow them to regain traction. Once the vehicle detects wheel slip, the first solution thought of was to engage the brakes to prevent that wheel from continuing to slip. All you need to do this is an ABS unit like this and some associated hardware, and your traction control unit can figure out the rest. But braking alone does have a major drawback. Applying the brakes, even for a fraction of a second, can cause not only a negative feel to the driver, but the immediate application of the brakes can cause a wheel to lock up, because when a wheel loses traction, the braking force is not stopping the car's weight, but rather solely the rotation of the wheel. Yes, the traction control unit can compensate for that, but locking up the brakes for even a very short amount of time reduces the efficiency of traction control. So for that reason, braking is usually coupled with the ability to reduce engine, or in the case of an EV, motor torque. This throttle manipulation gives traction control less of a jolt as it engages. It's much smoother to back off the power from the engine or electric motor, and in low traction environments, smooth, controlled deceleration of a wheel rotation is much better. And because the engine power can be cut, if the driver is doing something dumb, like keeping his foot to the floor even with no traction, the brakes don't have to work against the engine. Brakes can still be used, but this is really a last resort because of the aforementioned negatives. How does traction control actually work? There's three important things happening here. Detecting a wheel slipping, calculating the needed speed reduction, and physically performing the wheel speed reduction. So how do we detect a wheel slipping? It's not as easy as figuring out the vehicle speed and detecting which wheel is spinning slower or faster, because that happens all the time. When a car goes around corners, the outside wheels travel further in the same amount of time as the inner wheels, so in simple systems, there's a bit of a margin built in between the vehicle speed and the wheel speed. Complex systems measure the steering angle, the wheel speeds, the vehicle acceleration, not just forward and backwards, but side to side, as well as rotational or yaw acceleration, and based on all those readings, can accurately determine the calculated wheel speed. And because we have wheel speed sensors, if there's any difference between the calculated speed and the actual speed, we know that wheel is slipping. So how much do we need to slow that wheel down? This depends on calculating the coefficient of friction. We could take the last known coefficient of friction based on the calculated engine power when the wheel lost traction, but there's more accurate and reliable ways to calculate the coefficient of friction. One way is that when a vehicle's front wheels are turned, they want to return to going straight, or return to center. We could put a sensor in the steering rack that determines the amount of force in which the wheels return to center. And because all forces to return the wheel to center from within the vehicle are known, the only unknown is the friction between the tire and road surface, and that's our coefficient of friction. So we calculate how much power can be sent to the wheels based on that coefficient of friction, and reduce the engine power until the calculated max power is met. But let's finally get into it. What does Jason mean when he says that an internal combustion engine vehicle can only modulate its power output two times a second, and an EV can modulate power output a thousand times per second? Well, as we learned from the previous two videos, the best way to engage traction control is to modulate power output first, and only use brakes if necessary. So if an EV can modulate power a thousand times a second, then an EV has a significant advantage in application of traction control. Let's look at a Ford F-150 Raptor R and a Ford F-150 Lightning. And we'll look at 15 miles an hour just to give us a frame of reference for how fast the engine is rotating. So at 15 miles an hour, in one second a vehicle travels 22 feet. This works out to 2.27 rotations for the Raptor tires and 2.55 rotations for the Lightning tires. Now we can look at the spec data for these vehicles, and the Raptor has a gear ratio of 4.1 in the differential and 4.69 in first gear, so the engine is rotating 43.65 times per second at 15 miles an hour. It's a bit murkier for the Lightning because Ford doesn't provide any gear ratios, but this teardown video says it's approximately 9 to 1, which seems reasonable given the top speed and acceleration of the Lightning. So the E-motors are rotating 22.95 times per second at 15 miles an hour. Now let's look at how many times the power is modulated per a single engine or motor rotation. The Raptor R has a V8, and because it's a four-stroke engine, there are eight power strokes per two rotations of the engine, or four power modulations per rotation. The Lightning uses three-phase electric motors, meaning there are three power modulations per rotation. So all this means that the Lightning EV can modulate power 68.85 times per second, and the Raptor can modulate power 174.6 times per second. Is Jason completely wrong? He exaggerated a bit, but he's not wrong. The Lightning can modulate power output 70-ish times per second, and each modulation can be anywhere between full power and full regen braking, giving an EV an incredible ability to not only have a very rapid change of output, but a wide variance or amplitude in that change. But a gas engine can't do that. If you've been in a car that's misfiring, you'll know that sometimes you can barely feel one misfire. So that means we can stop sending power to the wheels 175 times per second, but because the engine has so much inertia, each power modulation has less of an effect on the engine power. To get to a point where we can control engine modulation, we would generally have to go through an entire engine cycle to experience pumping losses, also known as engine braking. And pumping losses are still not as strong as regen braking in an EV. 
So if you calculate this out, we can only modulate power to the wheels 22-ish times per second, and the range of modulation we have is much lower than that of an EV. So an EV has a huge advantage over an ICE vehicle, both in frequency of power output modulation, as well as the amplitude of the modulation. And again, Jason may be exaggerating a bit, as the power modulation is 70-ish for an EV and 20-ish for a combustion engine, but he is right that traction control in an EV gives it a significant advantage. You don't have to stay for this part, it's just bonus information, but there's another way that vehicles calculate the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road. Some systems will detect the difference in wheel speed between a driven or non-driven wheel, or, under braking, the difference between the front brakes at 100% utilization and the rear brakes at less than 100% utilization. Knowing the difference in speed and using some very complicated math that I don't understand, you can calculate the amount of grip available on the road.